But uh, anyway, so you're very kind. You're very kind, and and I and I love these chats we have. But yeah, let me let me just talk. Let me just start this conversation about Jerusalem. And man, again, it's your show. So just if I say something that really fires you up, just jump in and tell me to hush and, and go off on it. But <laughs> here's the thing, brother. Here's what I was telling my church this last Sunday morning before the Wednesday decision. So, but it had been announced that he probably was going to make that decision Wednesday. And here's the perspective. I, you know, I preach prophecy stuff all the time in my church. Now, now I preach the whole Word of God. I mean, I don't just focus on prophecy. My folks will tell you that. But I'm always seeing through the lens of the prophetic Word of God, and, and, and especially current day events, we're living in the most prophetic times since the first coming of Jesus Christ. Anybody that knows the Word and anybody that pays attention to current events and the connections to them, if you know the Word, you can't miss prophetic connections. And and I'm not saying we set dates. I don't. I'm not a date setter. You're not a date setter. And I, I don't run around with a placard on my back saying the sky is falling, and you don't either. But I'm just saying we take what the Word of God plainly says about last day's occurrences without setting them on any particular chart or graph or map. And then we take a look at what's actually happening in the world, and we compare those things. And we, we do that contextually and exegetically, and we say, could this be that, or could this be the beginning of that, or, or might this be a foreshadowing of, of something that is soon to come that the Bible said. So when you do that, that's called living life through a biblical worldview. And the Word of God comes alive, and life comes alive to you, the spiritual the spiritual domain, the, the unseen realm, I mean, all of it, it comes alive to you. The, the understanding of, of spiritual warfare and what's really happening, the gods behind the thrones. There's a cheap plug for my new book, Gods and Thrones. Um, but, I mean, it does. It, when you look at life that way, without being crazy about it, just being balanced and contextual and sound-minded, like the Word of God says, it changes your life. And so I told my church last Sunday, I said, guys, and you know I've been the pastor there for 31 years, so I told them, how many times have I told you we're living in prophetic days? And they all died laughing, you know. And I said, how many times have I told you that I believe we're living in the most prophetic days since the first coming of Jesus Christ? And they all, you know, died laughing. I mean, that old sanctuary full of four or 500 people, they were dying laughing. And I said, well, how many times have I told you in the last year that we are now living on the other side of the 70th year of Israel's return to the land. And, boy, they started clapping and, you know, whistling, hooping and hollering because they know, they get it. And I said, and, you know, how many times have I told you that this year marks the 50th year since the Six-Day War and Israel's reclaiming of Jerusalem, at least the East Bank as its own, and, and the West Bank, too, in, in theory, has right. been disputed for 50 years, and they've been called occupiers and all that, but, hey, they want it fair and square, and 50 years. Now, you know, those numbers, 70 and 50, are very important, and it's interesting that they fall on the same year. Also falls in this Super Shemitah year. It also falls, I mean, I mean there's, it also falls in the first year of one Donald right. Trump. It also falls with his proclamation about about moving the embassy to Jerusalem, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, that also falls right before Christmas, the first coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean, brother, just think of all these connections. And I said right. to our folks, I said, you know, this is interesting. I said, 70 years Israel has been in the land. There was no Israel there for 2,500 years, brother Dan. Yet, during those 2,500 years, the Word of God said that in the last days, some, some scriptures literally say that. Other scriptures intimate that it's the last days, but I'm just going to mm -hmm. paraphrase. The Word of God says that in the last days, sometime just before the return of Jesus Christ, Israel will come back to the land, and it will become a prominent nation. And other nations will eventually begin to form alliances against it. It will become so prominent, so, so powerful, so strong, and the nations will eventually line up against it because they will join together and they will hate it. And the nations that are listed in the scriptures that speak of that unbelievable occurrence happen to all now be Muslim nations. 
and they happen to mostly be in the Middle East and Northern Africa, and they happen to be directly connected to other nations like perhaps Russia, Gog, Magog, perhaps right. China, um, other scholars believe. And we just happen to be living on the other side of 2011 and the Arab Spring and the collapse of the Middle East and Russia coming to the Middle East and China coming to the Middle East and Russia and China being connected to North Korea. They're threatening to blow up the number one world superpower with nuclear war, the United States. Russia and China are the number two, number three nuclear superpowers. Uh, Israel's the number three or number four nuclear superpower. They're all crammed in the Middle East together, and when you include the fact that we're over there too, our troops are there, and of course we're directly connected to Israel, the top four nuclear superpowers in the world, the number one nuclear superpower in the Middle East, which is Israel, um, we're all there together. We're all there. Right. And, and, and along the Euphrates River. And, and Russia and China are correct are connected to Iran, ancient day Persia. And Iran has been connected to North Korea in that it has been supplying nuclear technology to North Korea. It was announced just a couple of months ago in mainstream media. So I mean brother, all of this is happening in these times in which we're living. And I'm telling and I was telling my church, I said, guys, do you get this? So so seventy years ago and I told my audience, I said, look, so everybody in here that's under the age of 70, I said, most of us have a hard time even thinking about this because all of our lives Israel has been there. And it's been on the map. It's been in our textbooks. And I said, but it's also been in the daily news, the evening news, almost every night of my life, Brother Dan. I'm 62 years old. I mean, yeah. I can't remember a time when some week went by that Israel and the Arabs and the Palestinians and Islam and terrorism and land for peace deals and peace summits. I, I, it's my whole life it has been wrapped right. around Israel. Now, we also think, I told my audience, I said, think of this. Even the people here that are older than 70, you'd have to be close to 80 to really have any real memory of Israel returning. And I said, so those of you that are 80 and older, I said, I don't know if you realize what you saw happen, the prophetic thing that happened in your lifetime. You saw the return of Israel, a 2,500-year-old biblical prophecy for 2,500 years. Well, that's 25 generations of 100-year-olds that never saw what they were longing for. But you people sitting in my church tonight, this morning, who are 80 years old and older, you lived it, really 70 years old and older, but around 80 is when you would really, really remember it. You lived it. And then I looked and I said, but now I want all the children and teenagers to listen to me. And I pointed to them all over the congregation. I want you to listen to me. I said, as powerful as all of that is, I said, this week, Wednesday, if President Trump makes this declaration and signs that document, or or, or doesn't sign it, doesn't, you know, it allows it to go through, I said, do you do realize that for the first time in 2,500 years, Jerusalem will now be officially named and recognized by the number one nuclear superpower, <laughs> us, which makes it basically recognized by the world whether they like it or not. You do realize for the first time in 2,500 years, you will see another biblical prophecy explode on the forefront of the world. And I said, please remember, when this happens... The very next day, we still have to mow our grass and pay our bills and go to the dentist and go to school and save for the future and fight the next door neighbors and all the stuff of life, just like the shepherds. When the angels appeared to them in that field that night, they had a supernatural mountaintop religious experience. <laughs> they went into the little village. They looked into the face of a baby. They were overwhelmed. But then they had to go back out and keep the sheep. And they yeah. got on with their life. And it would be 30 years before that little baby would start walking the Jordan River and the shores of Galilee and begin his ministry. And then it would be three more years later before he'd be on an old rugged cross. And you know what? We don't read anything in the scriptures about the shepherds being at the cross. 
No. And I don't know why that is. Probably they were all dead. I mean, because if they were in their 30s and 40s and 50s, 33 years earlier, the life expectancy 2,000 years ago, they, they probably weren't even alive. If they were still alive, and they probably weren't, weren't, because there's no mention of the shepherds being anywhere around his ministry years or at the crucifixion. So the point being is, after they left Bethlehem in the stable, they, they got on with their life. Now, their life would never be the same because of the angelic visitation and the profoundness of what they had experienced. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that before Jesus would do all of that, grow up and, and 30 years old and begin a ministry in three years and then go to the cross in three days and the resurrection, and then 50 days, the ascension, or 40 days, the ascension, and 10 more days, the birth of the church, and, and you know, before, I mean, before all of that happened, I mean, years, decades went by and life just went on. And, and, and so the point being, that that's how prophecy unfolds. Very seldom is there a bolt that comes out of the sky. Now, at the second coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus said that was going to be different. He said, now, the whole world's going to see that. East, as lightning strikes from the east and seen in the west, it, it, it's going to be like that. And the angels with the stars will fall from the skies. The sun and the moon will not give their light. The angels of God from the four corners of the earth will gather their elect and on and on and on. So we know that. But in the meantime, these major events of the first coming of Jesus Christ, man, from when God uttered that prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, you know, the seed of the woman, will you'll bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. From there until the birth of that baby in Bethlehem, it's 4,000 years. Forty 100-year generations. Forty. 100-year generations before it happened. In the meantime, it's the rise and fall of empires and the captivity for 400 years in Egypt and the birth of Israel and Saul and David and Solomon and the divided kingdom in Assyria and Babylon and Persia and Greece and finally the Roman Empire. But yet, here's the thing, Brother Dan. In the middle of those 4,000 years, guess what was happening? Everything was moving towards the coming of the Christ. Whether each generation saw it or not, whether they recognized it or not, whether they even knew about it or not, or whether they even cared about it or not, God's plan was moving forward. Everything he ever said was coming to fruition, and it came to fruition in Bethlehem that night. But it would still be 33 years later before it really hit the pinnacle with the resurrection. And so I told our congregation... I told the children, teenagers, I said, I want you to look at me. This Wednesday night, if President Trump makes this declaration, you will have watched prophecy being born in a manger, if you will, just just right. in an obscure little place, a little teeny country in the middle of the Middle East, in turmoil, a war-torn area, this little teeny nation that most of the world hates in a manger, <laughs> A, a city that is divided, an abomination that causes desolation standing on the holy place. <laughs> and I'm not saying that's the Antichrist, but I mean, you know, the Alaska Mosque right. is right there on the Temple Mount. And, 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 and I said, and if he does this, because Sunday morning, I mean, we didn't know if he would. He said he was. But I said, if he does it, the next day you'll have to get up and go to school. and Your mom and daddy will be taking you to the dentist and the doctor. and You'll be thinking about life and your next meal and the football game and who your boyfriend and girlfriend is and all that. And they were giggling and laughing. I said, but what you will, I want you to know is that you will be watching a 2,500-year-old prophecy burst to life before your eyes. And you will be, if the Lord tarries, you'll be able to tell your children and grandchildren you were alive on that day and you remember it when Jerusalem was declared the possession, the sole possession of Israel, the capital. And I said, let me tell you why that's important. Because the Old Testament declares that in the last days, eventually, the nations of the world will surround Jerusalem because they will be enraged by something that happens in Jerusalem. And they will want Israel wiped off the map. The New Testament, Jesus said, in the last days, when you see the armies of, of the world gathering around Jerusalem, then you will know that the return of the Christ is near. Not only that, I said, but it was Jerusalem that was declared the city of God by King David. It was Jerusalem where the tabernacle was brought back 
to the city and where the Ark of the Covenant was brought back in. It was Jerusalem where Solomon built the temple and the Temple Mount. It was Jerusalem where where the people of Babylon, uh, I mean Babylon, came in and destroyed the city and leveled the temple and took Israel into captivity for 2,500 years. It was it was Jerusalem where the Persians allowed Israel, uh, Israelis, uh, Hebrews to return and to rebuild the second temple. It was Jerusalem that became the center of attention under the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, uh, the, and, and eventually, of course, the Ottoman Empire later. But Jerusalem, 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 the center of the Crusades. Jerusalem, the place where Jesus uh, began his ministry. Jerusalem, the place where Jesus was crucified. Jerusalem, the place where Jesus rose from the dead. Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, the place where Jesus ascended into heaven. Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, the place where he is returning to set his foot as King of kings and Lord of lords in the very last days and the coming age and the restitution of all things. And I told my young people, I said, and you are the generation that gets to see it happen. Yeah. Amen. And that's what I want your audience to know, brother. This is Amen. huge. Now, there are all kind of political ramifications, and we can talk about that in a moment. No. The, the leftists, no, their heads are exploding. Did, uh, I think you did a really good job, uh, Carl. Um, and, and that's the point. And I'm, yeah, am I cutting you off kind of sort no, of because of, no. this, because of this fact? You know, you just gave the most, and that's why I ask you. Um, you just gave incredible testimony. I mean, it is. It's a 2,500-year-old prophecy. We saw it fulfilled, and you're right. That's the big thing that people don't understand about prophecy as it comes true today is because they have to go on with their lives, and they don't see a dramatic change, and they don't realize the years and things just like you mentioned. And so that is a wonderful description, and what better season to be in to do this and... The Satanists wanted to install their own tribute, a pagan idol, on the Capitol grounds right next to the Ten Commandments. Billions around the planet are witnessing a world in the grasp of sadistic spiritual darkness. This unholy alliance has infected our governments, our religious institutions, and our societies. The world appears to be unraveling. But can the evil behind these dark supernatural forces be defeated? Is everything playing out just as the Bible predicted it will in the final days? At last, you can know the answers to mankind's most urgent questions and learn your destiny among today's events in the new, unprecedented work taking the prophecy world by storm. Gods and Thrones, Nakash, Forgotten Prophecy and the Return of the Elohim by best-selling author, former decorated law enforcement officer and senior pastor Carl Gallops. This changes everything. Available now wherever fine books are sold.